On Larry King now, Robert Herjavec. You're known as the night nice shark. Wow, you why like couldn't that? I be known as the successful shark or the grr shark or something? I am the night nice shark. What makes a good pitch? The person. We film, on average, the pitches in front of us for over an hour. We make up our mind 50% of the time in the first two minutes. Do you think you use your immigrant mentality as a force for your success? Good and bad. As people say to me, I'm a, I'm a great guy to know. I'm a little hard to live with at times because, because I always have this chip on my shoulder. It's not your ability to be happy when the sun is shining that determines success. It's your ability to absorb failure on the days where everybody hates you, it's raining, people are mean to you, your dog doesn't even like you. If you can be happy on those days and move forward, you got something. Plus, people think that when you become rich, you become a jerk. The people that I've met that are wealthy were jerks before they had any money. Great wealth amplifies who you are. All next on Larry King Now. King now, our special guest is Robert Herjavec, the celebrated entrepreneur, best-selling author, founder of the Herjavec Group. Robert is one of the stars of ABC's Emmy-winning series Shark Tank and its Canadian counterpart, Dragon's Den. His latest book, You Don't Have to Be a Shark, Creating Your Own Success. We have it right here. It's a terrific read. I didn't know there's a Dragon's Den yeah, all over the world. It actually runs in 40 countries. The show is owned by Sony. And it's everywhere called in the world, Dragon's it's Den. called Dragon's Den. When they brought it to America, Mark Burnett, who produced the show, said, what's a dragon? Some mythical, fluffy creature. It's never going to work in the States. And he changed the name to Shark Tank, which is a great name. Why does Dragon's Den work? Uh, do they call you, well, hello, dragon? <laughs> <laughs> you know, dragons were not cool until Game of Thrones. Now that Game of Thrones has made dragons kind of cool, it's different. But everywhere in the world it's called dragons because that's a mean, you know, fire-breathing girl creature. But I like Shark Tank. You're enormously successful. You made a dream of an immigrant's, the immigrant's dream. Why did you have to write a book? Actually, this is my third book. And the reason we wrote the first book was uh, I'm Eastern European. And, you know, Europeans respect education and authors more than money. So my mom always used to think, maybe one day you'll write a book. Yeah, it wasn't a book. Yeah, maybe you write it. It wasn't make a million dollars or buy a big house. And so the reason we wrote this book was after doing Shark Tank for seven seasons, what I've learned is people are deathly afraid of sales. They're afraid to put themselves out there. They think you have to be a real jerk about it or pushy. They don't understand sales. And so this is a sales book for the non-salesperson. You're known as the nice shark. Wow, why like couldn't that? I be known as the successful shark or the grr shark or something? I am the nice shark. I'm a pretty nice guy, and uh, I try to be really respectful to the people that come out because it's their dream. I mean, as crazy as the idea is, it's someone's passion. You immigrated from you, what was then Yugoslavia, right? Yep to Canada. To Canada. Why Canada? My dad wanted to come to America, but America wouldn't take us. Yeah. It was Why really not? hard to get into America. We applied and the immigration wouldn't let us in, but Canada took us in with open arms. That's why I'm so touchy about the whole immigration thing. I, you know, I'm, everybody in this country is an immigrant from somewhere. That's right. We all are, except the American natives. Absolutely. So I'm always about open the borders, let the people in, and uh, to a degree, but this is the land of opportunity. My dad always thought, America. One day, one day we go to America. We ended up in Canada. Where in Canada? So my dad escaped from jail. My dad used to say, Larry, he was a political prisoner. But he was an 18-year-old kid who got up in a bar and said the wrong thing against Tito and communism, and he got thrown in jail. So most people would say, OK, don't do that again. He did it all the time, and he was in jail 22 times. And the last time, they said, if you come back, you will never come back. Because, you know, they had an island called Bieliotok, which is when you were a really bad political guy, they sent you there and you never came back. So we crossed the border to Italy, my mom and I, my dad, one suitcase, we land in Halifax, 
on a boat called the Cristofero Colombo. How melodramatic is that? <laughs> My mom remembers she has a friend in Toronto. We take the train to Toronto and we live in their basement for two years. What did your dad do in, America, in Canada? Um, my dad swept floors in a factory, and he worked his way up to become a millwright, but he was a blue-collar guy, which was really hard for him, because back in Yugoslavia, he was a singer, entertainer. Did he get to see your success? Um, to a degree. He, he always saw me when we did the show in Canada. He never saw the success here in the States. Passed away? Passed away from uh, cancer. You didn't speak English, right? Back then, there was no English courses. They took you to school, they threw you into a classroom, and they just started speaking English to you. And the kid I sat behind is still one of my best friends. The very first day I came to Canada. It's incredible. Do you think you use your immigrant mentality as a force for your success? Good and bad. As people say to me, I'm a, I'm a great guy to know. I'm a little hard to live with at times. Because... because? I always have this chip on my shoulder about being an immigrant. You know, I think that once you don't fit in, you always have this need to fit in. I always feel like I'm working towards something that is probably never going to get there. So I always feel this need to work harder, run harder, push harder, do more. Was your goal financial success? Uh, my goal was lack of poverty. Mark, yeah, Same thing, isn't it? Mark Cuban and I had this talk. When he was 12 years old, he said he knew he wanted to be rich. I just didn't want to be poor. I think they're different things. You know, I think Mark wanted to make a lot of money, and he's worth more than I am, so maybe there's something to that. I just didn't want to live like we were living. You were on Dancing with the Stars, did yeah. pretty well, married the girl, or are, are you married? Uh, about to marry the girl. About to marry yeah. the girl you that's, danced That's with. what a good salesman I am. You write in the book that there's a link between dancing and selling. Explain. When I got on the show, I said to Kim, uh, her name is Kim Johnson, I said, Kim, how do you know when someone can't dance? And I thought it would be in their feet, in their arms, how they hold their body. And she said, surprisingly, well, probably not surprisingly to you, it's in their eyes. People that don't think they can dance, because it's all about confidence, their eyes look everywhere. They look like a deer in the headlights. People that maybe can't dance, but think they can, look directly at the audience. They project an air of confidence. The book is You Don't Have to Be a Shark. The guest is Robert Herjavec. Up next, we're talking to Shark Tank's nicest investor about what makes a good pitch, when to cut your losses. Stay with us. Back with Robert Herjavec, the book You Don't Have to Be a Shark, Creating Your Own Success. What makes a good pitch? The person. We film, on average, the pitches in front of us for over an hour. The longest pitch was two and a half hours. The shortest was 40 minutes. It all gets edited into seven to eight minutes. We make up our mind 50% of the time in the first two minutes. It's how you stand, the cadence of your voice, how you walk out, all of those things. I want to invest in somebody who's confident without being arrogant. I don't want to invest in a wallflower, but I want somebody who's arrogant and over the top. How have you personally done with your investments on Shark Tank? I like to say I've got the best track record. My average return is 12.8 percent, but there's some who are on life support. I mean, the challenge is not so much finding the successful businesses. What we've learned is how do you get an exit? Because a lot of these businesses are relatively small. Who's going to buy them? So now we try to structure a dividend or something where we can actually get some of the money back. What's been the most successful? Uh, for me, it was a product called Tipsy Elves. Inappropriate, ugly Christmas sweaters. Doctor and a lawyer, tired of being a doctor and a lawyer, so they want to start a business. Inappropriate, ugly Christmas sweaters. They come on the show, they're doing 600000 a year four years ago. Now we're doing $17 million. Some for $80, make them for 6 bucks. Where do they sell them? That's a good business. Online. It's pure online. There's no retail stores, nothing. It's, it's eight employees. It's incredible. And what did you invest and what do you get? Uh, I think it was 200000 for 20% or something. Yeah, we, they just keep sending us money. It's the best investment in the world. They just send us checks. Do you, uh, when the deal is made, do you get together with them the next day? And how's it, well, let's say you make the deal for 200000 yeah. 
What's the modus operandi? What happens? Yeah, so we, we usually like to wait till we're done filming. Right. The whole show. We film in June and we film in September. But once the deal is done, our team gets involved with them, the lawyers, the accountants. We like to verify everything. And then we get involved, finish negotiating the deal. Sometimes it changes, and then we're off and running. What didn't work that you thought definitely would? Uh, there's been a few. There's been a few. You know, the, the funny thing is people think when they get an investment, it's the finish line. They think it's over. I mean, I'll never forget one year, we gave somebody some money, and we said, what are you going to do with the money? And she said, I'm going to buy a car. And we're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> the money is for the business. You've got to grow your business. And she was like, what do you mean? I can't buy a car with it? And we're like, no. <laughs> Those are always tough. People that aren't sophisticated enough. Are you enjoying doing it? Yeah, I love it. I love it. It's I think not it, your principal source of I mean, you make good money, but it's not the principal source. We make awful money. What are you talking about? You we, don't make good no, money? No, we don't get We make money off the investments. I mean, I... So you don't get paid a lot to do the show? We don't get paid a lot. No, we get paid, but we don't get paid a lot. It's shocking. I know. You would, stars, think I would negotiate a, a you would think I would negotiate a better deal, but I think it's an honor and a privilege to do the show. I mean, I think back to... You know, where I started, we we're talking about immigrants. When I think back where I started, and now I'm on TV, and the show is so inspiring for so many people, especially kids. Kids? Kids. We're one of the top shows for family viewing. I was at a charity event in Orlando, Runway for Hope, and it's kids with cancer. And there were kids from 2 years old to 19 years old. You would be amazed how many eight-year-olds knew everything about our show. They loved the show. What was your personal first success? Uh, computer company. I've always been in the computer business. I produced the Winter Olympics for Canada when I was 19, in 1984. My head got this big, couldn't make any money in the film business. So I got a job in the computer business and built a company and sold it for uh, $65,000. And so on top of my income that year, I made, I think it was 150000 And I remembered getting the check, going home, and thinking, oh, my God, really happy? And then I was really uh, sad. And my friend said, why are you so sad? I said, this is it. I will never make more money in a single year than this. That was a long time ago. How much have you personally invested in Shark Tank? Uh, millions. Millions. All right, this book is for everybody. It's for the uh, average not person. Not for a salesman? Well, it's for a salesman, but I think there's really great sales books. This is a sales book for the non-salesperson, the person who's afraid to do sales. You know why they're afraid to do sales, Larry? Why do you think most people are afraid to do sales? Afraid to hear no. They're afraid of rejection. They take it extremely personally. They think that someone's saying no to them. People would rather wallow in mediocrity then get to a point where they hear a yes or a no. I want to hear no. If you're not going to buy something from me, don't waste my time. My friend Herbie Cohen, who wrote You Can Negotiate Anything, which is a great book, said that you're selling yourself every day and you're negotiating every day and everything. In every You negotiate with your wife as soon right. as the day begins. Right. Where do you want to go tonight? <laughs> to negotiate. You're negotiating for a raise. You know, a mom's negotiating with her kid to eat more vegetables. Sales is everything. Up next, we'll talk about Robert's guilty pleasure, childhood crush, and the characteristics he thinks is most important to succeed in business, even some politics. Stay with us. <laughs> We're back with Robert Herjavec. You don't have to be a shark is the book. As a Canuck, I'd like to get your take. What are, you, what are they talking about in Canada? I know you live in L.A., but what are they talking yeah. about? What are they saying about Trump? American politics. Somebody in Canada said to me, what's your favorite TV show? And I said, uh, my favorite reality show is American politics. <laughs> uh, they're amazed. You know, the, the whole Trump aura and the election is really incredible. It's fascinating for the rest of the world. What do you think of him as a successful businessman into this world of politics and the impact he's made? I met him a number of times. I've met Hillary a number of times. You, regardless of how you, what you feel about Donald Trump, you cannot deny that man has a persona and a character. You get him in front of a large group of people, it's a party. You know, he reminds me of the cool kid in high school. Everybody wants to go to his party. 
I mean, it's incredible to us. He can even change his opinions that don't matter. <laughs> Like, look at the things he says, Larry. Who else could say those things? And people are like, ah, oh, it's a Trumpism. <laughs> Do you vote with your heart or your pocketbook? Both. Both. I vote with my heart to begin because I have to be emotionally invested in something. I mean, I think at a certain point in life, you get to do the things you want and you can stop doing the things you have to. What do you think of Justin Trudeau? I was good friends with the former prime minister. I interviewed him. And Stephen Harper, and he, him and his wife uh, supported us during Dancing with the Stars. So, of course, I have to say, he was a better prime minister. <laughs> but I love Justin Trudeau. All right, Robert, we're going to play a little game of If You Only Knew. I just I threw some questions. Throw it. Childhood celebrity crush. Raquel Welch. Secret talent. Uh, accordion. I can play a mean accordion. Guilty pleasure. Uh, French fries. Can't resist them. If you could trade places with someone for a day, who would it be? Larry King. If you could trade places with another shark, who would it be? Uh, Barbara. Business person you'd most like to guest judge on Shark Tank? Oh, um, Carlos Slim. Company you wish you'd invested in? Uber. One of the sharks did invest in Uber. He wrote one of the first checks, Chris Saka. They didn't appear on Shark Tank. No, they? no, no, <laughs> they didn't. So would you have bought it? I wouldn't have, and I'm very honest about that, because the idea of it, um, I, I didn't understand it at the time, but sometimes you get these out of whack, incredible businesses, and they just take off. I have to think that there's an element of luck to that. Well, the best example of that is the guy who founded Federal Express. Oh. Smith. Yeah, have you met him? Yeah. Yeah, right. incredible. I, met, I had the pleasure of meeting him once. It, incredible. Got a C minus in business at Harvard. Oh, his, I didn't know that. His project was FedEx. Right. He would buy the Railway Express Company, which is a, trans, a, a truck transport, and turn it into FedEx with planes. And the FedEx location would be Memphis. And you, all the package was, would go to Memphis. And the teacher said, this house is going to work. I'm sending a package from L.A. to Chicago, and it goes to Memphis. <laughs> it can't work. But he picked Memphis because there's never they never have fog. Oh, for the airlines. Yeah, so it, you always get into Memphis. Wow. You always get into Memphis. You know, amazing stat. He told me that the largest airline in the world is actually FedEx. That's right. Yeah, I didn't know that. And they also fly the mail. When you send something airmail, FedEx has the contract. For the U.S. Post Office? Yeah. Oh, FedEx has that. the contract. Hmm. Something uh, you're bad at. Oh, I'm bad at so many things. From golf to <laughs> accounting to all kinds of things. Uh, last time you were starstruck? Uh, when I met you. Uh, oh, stop. No, seriously, a week and a half ago. Mm. I always, I, I loved your show, and I loved your ability to interview people and make them appear human. When you interviewed people, seriously, I'm not saying that because you're here, but when you interview people, I always felt like I was in the room. Thank you. And I thought that was an incredible quality. Last time you cried? Uh -huh, over the weekend. I was hosting a charity event for, uh, called Runway to Hope for kids with cancer. And there was a uh, young girl, she was eight years old, and she had taken a turn for the worse, and she had uh, less than a month. And she was in a wheelchair. I, I don't care how human you are, or how strong you are, in, and her parents were there, and they were so happy, and she was so happy to meet me. Like, I, if that doesn't get to you, you, you're not alive. If you weren't a businessman, what do you think you'd do? I thought about being a professional soccer player. I'm actually very good at soccer. What do people get wrong about Canada? Uh, we are good business people. We're not nice all the time. We have a backbone. What do Canadians get wrong about America? We think they're all mean. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest regret? Uh, no regrets. Move the most, forward. What characteristic is most important to succeed in business? Perseverance. The ability to absorb failure. You're going to hear no way more than you're going to hear yes. And that's when I started out. That's what I thought. I thought, you know, you go out, good things happen. Well, you learn pretty quickly in life, crap happens. It's not your ability to be happy when the sun is shining that determines success. It's your ability to absorb failure on the days where everybody hates you, it's raining, people are mean to you, your dog doesn't even like you. If you can be happy on those days and move forward, 
you got something. Derek Jeter said, understanding baseball is understanding failure. Wow. Well, you don't hit 500. Well, what's the top baseball player hit? 345? 345, that's it. Right, think that about means that. means you've failed six and a half yeah. times. Yeah. And tell me something people don't know about you. I'm much taller in real life. No. <laughs> Robert will answer your social media questions after the break, and that's funny. Stay with us. We're back with Robert Herjavac. You don't have to be a shark creating your own success. You have a penchant for expensive cars, right? I love cars. You race cars? I do. You know why I love cars? Why? My dad and I come to Canada. We come from Yugoslavia. The hottest car in Yugoslavia was something called a Yugo. I you ever heard that. of it? Yeah. Sure. They used to give you a Yugo when you bought a Cadillac yeah. in Texas. So my dad and I are walking down the street. This car goes by. And I'm like, wow, dad, what's that? And he says to me, you know mind, that Cadillac. And I'm like, because he saw it in the Elvis movies and everything. And I said, Dad, what's a Cadillac? He says, ah, Cadillac, that for rich people. And ever since then, I've loved cars, I swear. Even when I had no money, I would get a car. Like a, one of my first cars was a 19... 87 Mazda RX-7. It was gold. The doors didn't close. Had to hold the handle when it churned. Loved it. Same passion, just bigger ticket items. Did you race? I did. I used to race quite a bit. I was pretty good at it. Are you ever scared or do you always feel in control? I always feel like I'm in control of my own destiny. I feel like I can create any situation in life. But I'm smart enough to know that's not true. It doesn't matter. I feel that way. Social media questions. Yeah. Chloe Martinez on our blog says, what motivates you in business and in life? Uh, doing better. I, I just want to be successful. Sebastian Smith writes, would you do a deal with someone you think lacks integrity? No, because eventually they'll screw you. Can you develop integrity? Uh, yeah, you can. I believe in second chances. Penelope Black writes, I need to ask for a raise, but I'm terrified. Give me a pointer. Uh, don't ask for a raise, offer value. The biggest mistake people make in asking for a raise is they start with I. Get the I out and talk about we. Here's what we did in the last year. Never ask for a raise in the beginning of the week because people are in a miserable mood. Never ask at the end of the day because everybody wants to go home. Find the right time, use the right words. Good, good advice. Jane McAvoy writes, the path to success is spotted with failure. What do you consider your biggest failure? The path to success is not spotted with failure. The path to success is constant failure spotted with some success. You got to let your winnings ride and you got to absorb your failures quickly. You got to get I, up I, off the floor, right? You got to get up off the floor. I never think of anything as a failure. I think everything you do gets you to this point. I think. The minute you think of failure, it's over. I, I've never thought I was a failure. Even in the worst, crappiest days, I never thought of myself as a failure in anything. Woody Allen said the key to success is showing up. Oh, I believe that. How many people are willing to do that? You know, Howard Schultz, when he started Starbucks, had to go to 342 banks to get funding. Think about that. I have an idea. I'm gonna sell coffee for $3. Give me some money. <laughs> How many people after 341 times, would get up the next day and show up the 342nd. Like Victor Borgia once said, my uncle invented a soft drink, called it one up. Then he tried two up, three up, four up, five up, six up, and gave up. <laughs> Little did he know how close he came. And then, <laughs> I just at, got that. At Von Sick, what was your first big splurge once you made your first million? I bought a house for my mom and dad. I paid off their house. I went to the bank and I paid off the mortgage on their house. In Canada? In Canada. Four months later, my mom realizes she's not getting the bills anymore. She goes to the bank and says, something wrong with bank. We don't get, the, we don't get bills. What's going on? Bank manager says, oh, Mrs. Herjavac, your son paid off your house. She cashed the amount that she owed she got a check that day, drove to my house, gave it to me, and said, don't you ever do that to us again. We're so proud of you. We don't need anything from you. Wow. I love my mom. Judy Smith wants to know when the wedding is. Uh, end of the summer. 
Do you ever go back to Croatia? I do. I only have, I don't have any family in North America besides my, my kids. So I have 50 cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody there. You grew up poor. What are the pitfalls of becoming rich when you grew up without money? There are no pitfalls to being rich. Rich is good. <laughs> rich I've is been poor and I've been greed. rich. Greed isn't good. Greed is not good, but rich is better than poor. I always think, Larry, that people think that when you become rich, you become a jerk. The people that I've met that are wealthy were jerks before they had any money. Great wealth amplifies who you are. If you're a jerk and you kick your dog when you have no money, guess what? You're going to do the same thing. Why do people with inherited wealth sometimes have problems? Uh, inherited wealth is completely different. All the wealth I talk about is earned. When you earn something, when you accomplish something, when you create something from nothing and you make it happen, nobody can ever take that away from you, even if the money goes away. Earned wealth, it's a whole different game. You didn't earn that. No. You lose the sense of accomplishment. And without accomplishment, you have no stamina and you have no confidence. You can't fake accomplishment. Anything you want to ask me? Uh, yeah, all kinds of things. Of all the successful people you've met, I'm not just talking about business, I'm talking about sports, athletes, everybody. What's the one characteristic that they have over people who are just there? They all had drive. They could have been shy, they could have been bombastic, they could have been, you know, withdrawn, or, but they all had an inner drive, and they all strove, they all strive, they, Ted Turner once told me, could have been toothpicks, didn't have to be money. Are all, I, just, I just wanted to have more toothpicks. Than are all successful people driven, are extroverts? Driven. Are they no, all? There don't have to be extroverts, no. No? Do you think that the, the average person who never becomes successful, why? What holds them back? They don't get off the porch. Really? They talk about others. See that guy, wanted, boy, if I could have been like him. Wow. I could have been like him. Do you have to be born with the characteristics to be know. successful? I don't know the answer to that. Or can you make those? I think you can make it. Yeah, I always say that when your current life and the pain of it is so great, you'll make the change. Do you think, what's the difference between people with extreme wealth, billions, and people with tens of millions? The tens of millions want to be the millions. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Thanks to my guest, Robert Hershevac. You don't have to be a shark. It's available wherever books are sold. You can find me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time.